A long time ago, in this very river, a world record fish was caught. It was such an impressive record that it still stands as one of the longest serving records to date. We're in Nipigon, Ontario, on the shores of the Nipigon River to celebrate that record. All this is coming up next on the new Fly Fisher. Fly Fisher has been made possible thanks to Ontario Sunset Country Tourism Association, GoFishingOntario.com, Orvis Sporting Traditions, Scientific Anglers, Umpqua Feather Merchants, Superfly, Fly Fishing Made Easy. Just an hour east of Thunder Bay, Ontario, on the banks of the largest tributary of Lake Superior, is a town called Nipigon, and this little town is steeped in history. Much of that history stemming from the Nipigon River. The Nipigon River is classified as a big river, connecting Lake Nipigon and Lake Superior. Its sheer volume of water is immense, stretching 48 kilometers long, and at its most wide, 200 meters across. In recent history, Nipigon was known as a mill town with the supply of wood products being the main industry. But after a 2007 fire which saw the mill burn to the ground, the main industry was shifted to, and today still, is tourism and fishing. Brook trout are a part of the identity of this little town. And for a long time, we just kind of took it for granted that you can still go out and realistically catch a trophy fish on a drive-to fishery where you can back your 18-foot boat in. There's not a lot of places oh, that nice you can one. do that for brick trout. Good fish. It's highly unusual. And it's been a fishing mecca for 150 years. There's so much history here, right? But the river is very different today compared to what it was back in its glory at the turn of the century. Three hydroelectric dams have been constructed on the Nipigon River, affecting the native brook trout that it was so famous for. Today, there is one 15-mile stretch of river from the mouth of Lake Superior to the Alexander Dam that sees returns of coaster brook trout, salmon, steelhead, amongst others. There's no industry on it, very few humans, very few cottages. So that's the headwater. So you're starting off with this huge, ultra-cold body of water that turns into a river that at one time was, without a doubt, the best trout water in the world as far as just rapids and pools and everything but it was harnessed for electricity. Where the world record was caught is now under about 60 feet of water. And that's, I mean, that's just what happened. But there's still brook trout in the whole system. There's still some rapids, and I think the best place in the world to catch a brook trout. The other two dams block upstream movement. You have two dam-locked areas in which to fish. Today, the fishery is very good, thanks to the help, in part, of now retired biologist, Rob Swainson. In 1950, when the Pine Portage Dam was built, it flooded out all those famous waters, all the famous pools, Robinson Pool, Hamilton Pool, Victoria Rapids, and of course, you know, the glory hole at Virgin Falls. Rabbit Rapids, where the world record was caught, they were all flooded out. And that really brought an end to the, to the fishery, and it brought an end to people traveling here to go fishing. The river was reduced uh, to a few hundred yards of white water, where there used to be 10 miles of white water. But you know, it's still, it's still got its spots today. And as, as population grows, it becomes more and more popular with people. It's interesting because each section has, there's things that are individual about them now. Like uh, the one section from Jesse Lake up to Pine Portage Dam, the fish do look different. They're more colorful. They're, uh, they tend to be fatter 
and I don't know if it's the food or if it's whatever's happening in that environment. That's the that's a stretch of river that is unique. Um, and then from the Alexander's Dam to Lake Superior, well, coaster brook trout can still come in there and spawn, which is what's been happening forever. So you can catch a coaster brook trout in the lower Nipigon River, but then you have other species mixed in, right? You have the um, Chinook salmon, you have steelhead, walleye, pike, you know, it's a real mixed fishery. And then you get up above uh, Pine Portage Dam into Lake Nipigon, and then you're into, you're into a whole different thing, a very, very pristine fishery, almost no non-native species there. Nipigon's fishing history is as storied as the town itself. At the turn of the century, the fishing in the Nipigon River was literally world-class and even brought royalty from overseas. Well, I find it amazing that people like came from England a hundred years ago on a steamship and they would like come up through the Great Lakes and then get on a train and <laughs> go to Lake Nipigon and then go down a river in a freighter canoe. Bugs that you can, I don't think we can even comprehend now, you know, without DEET, <laughs> like without bug mesh and, and do it because they knew it was the best place in the world to catch a brick trout and, and to potentially, you know, catch a world record. And the size class of the fish then were incredibly massive. They were looking for big fish. There's no question about that. Everybody is, but, but they didn't measure it by the individual fish. They measured it more as uh, a weight caught per day. So they'd report catching 50 pounds in a day or 75 pounds in a day or, or in a number of hours. They weren't really talking about the individuals until a little bit later on, like in those early 1900s, they actually started describing individual fish, you know, six, five pounders, four, three pounders. It was all weight, no links. It was one day back in 1915 that changed the way anglers measured their fish. Dr. J.W. Cook from Thunder Bay, Ontario, along with three friends, went on a guided trip up the Nipigon and rewrote the record books. They caught a fish that was so big, this world record still stands today, more than 100 years later. Here's the story. July 15th is when they started the trip up the Nipigon River. They paddled up from town here. They arrived at Rapid Rapids, uh, like they fished their way up, of course, and then uh, Rabbit Rapids, they they had set up camp and on July uh, 21st, uh, 1915, that's when Dr. Cook landed the world record brook trout. He's a young man. The picture of him holding the fish is pretty awesome. He was a young angler, like probably at his, you know, at his keenest and, uh, and he looked like an angler. Like he wasn't wearing a three-piece suit, right? <laughs> yeah, like, looked like he had suspenders on and just holding, but, but you know, he knew he had a good one. It was 14 and a half pounds, 31 and a half inches long. It had a girth of 23 inches and he caught it on a live minnow. He caught it on a fly rod, but he hooked a minnow on and cast it out. The, the river, he described the river as being covered with brown flies that morning. And uh, I think he switched it up so he wasn't competing with the, fly, with the, the big hatch. And what I find amazing is not only did he catch the world record, which in a, itself has lasted 100 years and was even 100 years ago so unusually large that it had to be sent away for identification. But he also caught two fish on one fly line with two flies that were also considered a world record. Same trip. So I think he was a pretty good stick. That was my sense of things that he knew, he knew his way around a fly rod. And, um, you know, and he's a legendary guy now. And as with all records that remarkable, there will be questions that accompany the catch any record fish, and I don't care what it is, and I mean, you can go over all the musky records and everything, there's always controversy with world record fish. And there's all sorts of stories about, you know, did Dr. Cook catch it, did one of the guides catch it, what it was caught on, all that. But we weren't there, right? Rob Swainson, he's taken it upon himself to do all this incredible historic work, and he's put the same kind of energy into that that he put into restoring the fishery. Well, I started digging into this, and as I dug out all these hundred, literally hundred, hundreds of articles. I was shocked at that, first of all. But as I dug through them, I started seeing contradictions. All these different articles reported something different. I'd read one place, it was 1915, 31 and a half inches long. Next one I picked up, it's reported as 34 inches long and uh, caught in 1916. In fact, the mount that was at the museum just before it burned in 1990. That mount had the label on it that said it was 34 inches long by nine inches deep or 18 inch girth and caught in 1916. 
which was totally contrary to what I'd read in these early, early documents from the turn of the century. So I wanted to get to the bottom of that, and it's, it's taken me, you know, I'm a slow, slow guy, I guess, 27 years. She's been uh, Columbo on this one. It's been pretty good, you know. None of us are ever going to know, but he has found stuff that, I mean, nobody knew there was a picture of Dr. Cook with a fish. And he found it. He's got all this other information, the log that they, you know, when they came and left, the two fish on the, all that stuff. I'm satisfied that I've answered some of these questions, but there's a lot to go after yet, and I, I'm not giving up on this. It was on Swainson's investigative journey he came across Cook's only living relative, Elizabeth Lytle, who fondly remembers her uncle as a modest man. I can smell his pipe. I can smell his pipe and I can hear his voice. And I always knew that he caught a big fish, but we never really talked about it. I knew the year and I knew the size because we had a photograph of the poster that they've made. It was small, but you know, it gave the details. What I remember really well was the rod. It was a bamboo rod and I, I remember the vivid colors. In fact, I used to charge my friends a nickel to go and look at it in the woodshed. But he never talked about fishing and, and I remember talking about it with my dad and after he caught that fish, he never fished again. Elizabeth has made the journey to Nipigon for a couple of reasons. To reconnect with the world record brook trout and to be part of the inaugural Nipigon Brook Trout Festival. That's coming up on the new Fly Fisher. Welcome back to the New Fly Fisher. We're in Nipigon, Ontario for the inaugural Nipigon Brook Trout Festival, celebrating the 100th anniversary of Dr. J.W. Cook's catch, the still standing 14 and a half pound brook trout world record. With things to do for every member of the family, professional angler presentations, and interactive information booths, the festival draws people from far and wide. We're celebrating the Nipigon River Brook Trout Festival, and through that festival, we're celebrating 100 years of the world record brook trout that was caught here on the Nipigon River, about uh, 60 kilometers up at a place called Rabbit Rapids. It's pretty amazing to have, to have a world record here, and you know, it was a hundred years ago and there are, you know, all kinds of stories that float around. So nobody knows for sure exactly how things went. But we do know that when the fish was caught, it was sent off to Ottawa to be verified. And it was verified as a 14 and a half pound brook trout. That's what we know, so that's what we celebrate. The heart of the festival lies in the Nipigon Historical Museum itself. Not only is it home of the skin mount of the world record fish, but it's home to hundreds of pieces from Nipigon's past. One of the more famous Nipigonians is Dan Gapin, the son of the creator of the muddler minnow, Don Gapin. Dan is here in Nipigon to sign autographs and to talk about brook trip fishing in the area. And of course, Dr. Cook's only living relative, Elizabeth Lytle. Elizabeth has come to the festival as a representative of the family. And as a bonus, she gets an unexpected surprise to see a very special piece of fishing history. <laughs> I remember you used to knock on Dad's door past the sea the rod. Now, how old might you have been then? Probably 10 or 11. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I mean, <laughs> and you know, it is in good shape. And, and you've said he's, he's initialed it as well. Does it show enough to yep. have a look? Oh, for him. Yes, I can see Cook. Welcome back to this truly historic episode of the new Fly Fisher celebrating the 100th anniversary of the world record brook trout caught by Dr. J.W. Cook. You know, the new Fly Fisher has been to the Nipigon River many times and we truly have caught some giants. Yes, sir. Right at that point, same spot as last time, Randy. Same spot, man, did this one ever hit hard? It was kaboom. You could feel it go <laughs> right on the, on the fly. <laughs> oh, man. This is just incredible. You have to come up and fish the Nipigon River. It's just unbelievable. You, you hear stories about it. The, the world record brook trout was caught here, and you can see why. A brook trout, when they reach a certain, a certain uh, size, 
switch from invertebrates to actual minnow type patterns or they'll even cannibalize themselves. He is, for not being a very big fish, he's using the current to his best advantage, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, here he comes. That's a nice, nice fish. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, actually, it's not as, you know, it's a little fatty, isn't he? Dino might. <laughs> this is so exciting. You gonna make a measurement here. Quick measurement. Actually, no, it's a 19, 19 inch fish. There's a trough drops off. It's kind of like a hump, just about the natural lay of that that hill in front of us, that point, and then it'll uh, deepen over there, deepen here, and then it fades out back into that shoreline, so. Well, this is a decent fish, actually. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble now seeing him, yeah. and he's gonna run. So I'll get him on this side of the boat now. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I just wanna kinda get out of this boily current I agree. try to land him, and I'm gonna swing around and circle him just to get him, get him above the boat again. Okay. The biggest thing is, is when they get below the boat, the fly will tear out. Okay. Uh, you see fish in here that hardware anglers catch and they, they force them and rip their mouths. There, we're good now. now. This guy's just coming up. Now, one, he's gone back down to the bottom again. <laughs> <laughs> that is a beautiful fish. Oh, this this is actually quite a nice fish. Yeah. Now, a, would that be above average or average? Uh, that's a little above average. He's tagged. He's been tagged by somebody, which is good. This yeah. is the, this goes down to the tag. Now here, I'll I'll help you out there. No, I'll hold just, it. Okay. There we go. Now we got him in there. That, that so, fish, being 21 and a half, I weighed it the other day when I sampled it, and it's a rough 5.6 pounds. Now that that to me is a record for myself. Biggest brook trout I've ever caught is four and three quarter pounds. So I'm really excited about this. Yeah. This is just a wonderful area. Oh man, I love so this brook is trout fishing. Just a point to make too, this is the third time this fish has been handled by anglers. So um, it, it's not, uh, catch and release definitely works. You know, it was initially tagged by uh, another angler. I captured it, I believe last week on the uh, 12th and uh, I have data written down on it, and then Bill captured it again today, so. This this is just absolutely the best. As far as I'm concerned, this is a must. Uh, a fish taken from here is a fish gone forever, so that's one thing you gotta remember. Um, there are other areas here where you can go and have a meal if you would like. Uh, if you wanna take a fish, it must be over 22 inches, and it can only be one fish. So the, I think the, the rules are really paying off, and uh, I'm all for them. Okay. Okay, we're gonna be very gentle with him. He's he's in good shape. The water's very cool. You there? He's, I can feel him on my my hand here. He's he's gonna take off. So. Guiding is a thriving business in the Nipigon area, with anglers fishing the Nipigon River itself as well as the coast of Lake Superior. I hook up with old friend Ray Rivard from Quebec Lodge in Nipigon, and we decide to hit the river to sample some of the brook trout fishing for ourselves. The fishing that Nipigon is famous for. Hey Ray. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about uh, your business with Nipigon River Adventures? We started up Nipigon River Adventures about seven years ago now, and we do a lot of different things fishing, photography, corporate retreats, B&B. &B. I've fished the Nipigon River probably for 35 years and the fishery has been getting stronger and stronger over the last few years and that's the result of conservation efforts that have been made not just by the fishermen but 
even with the government and, and their regulations. It's not an easy place to fish, and I encourage people to get guides, even if it's not our place. Safety is fir first and foremost. We want people to have a good experience on the river and, and catch once in a lifetime type of fish. There's a good fish. Keep them tight, keep them tight. You know, we're just below the Pine Portage Dam and this water is full of oxygen. The dam is absolutely hauling right now. And I think we're dialed in to a late Nipigon Brook trip. Great way to start the day, Ray. Beautiful. Good stuff. Thank you. All right, let me just get this glove wet. Nice fish. Great to start the day, huh? Nice colors. Now, what I like about these fish is that this is not a giant by any means, but look at how thick it is. Look at how deep the body is of this fish. It's absolutely great. I'm going to get it back in the water. We're going to go for a bigger one. Equipment used for fishing brook trout on the Nipigon River is a 9-foot, 8-weight fly rod with a full sinking line and 9-foot fluorocarbon leader. Flies were streamers of various colors, but we had most success with flies that had a bit of chartreuse. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this truly historic episode of The New Fly Fisher. For more on our series, please log on to www.thenewflyfisher.com. For all of us here at The New Fly Fisher, I'm Mark Melnick. Thanks for watching, and hopefully we'll see you in world record country. The new fly fisher has been made possible thanks to Ontario Sunset Country Tourism Association. GoFishingOntario.com Orvis Sporting Traditions Scientific Anglers Umpqua Feather Merchants Superfly Fly Fishing Made Easy